morning team and uh, welcome to today's Learn with Lorna. I'll get started in a few minutes. As soon as I start seeing the hellos coming up then I know I can get started. So uh, welcome to this week's Learn with Lorna. This is the 37th uh, in the series of Learn with Lorna talks. My name is Lorna Steele and I'm the Community Engagement Officer with the Highland Archive Service. This series, before I go any further, this series, uh, just to remind you, is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer. And High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to take part in these events. But if you're able to donate towards us, then we would really appreciate that. And there's a link to be able to do that within the text uh, of this live post on Facebook. I want to start, as I, as I often do, by saying thank you uh, to those of you who have, have commented, have emailed, have been in touch. Um, it's really, really appreciated. And particularly in the run up to, the Christmas, uh, to Christmas, I've had some really nice um, messages and some uh, really nice kind gestures from people and I'm so grateful for that, so thank you. Um, as you'll know if you've watched regularly, the Highland Archive Service has four offices, so we have one in Inverness, one in Portree, one in Fort William and one in Wick. And the collection I want to talk about this week comes from our archive in Wick, uh, from the Nucleus, the Nuclear and Caithness Archives. And we're going to look at the Hetty Munro collection. And before I go any further, two things to say. One is this is a collection that's in living memory. So I know when I posted on Twitter and on Facebook, I've seen uh, people saying that they remember uh, that they remember Hetty, that they remember the family, and that's really nice. And it, again, it's a privilege to me to know that sometimes I deal with things in the far, far past, but sometimes I deal with things that are um, quite recent and in people's living memory. So uh, that's always in my mind as well, that uh, it's not just not just the distant past. Uh, and I wanted to thank uh, my colleagues Valerie and uh, the other staff up at Nucleus who have been really, really helpful in getting uh, me ready with this one because it's uh, a subject that they know a lot about, a collection that they know a lot about, and I'm really grateful for their help with that. So first of all, what is this collection? What is the Hetty Munro collection? It comprises uh, six boxes of photographs and papers that were collected by Henrietta or Hetty Munro. Hetty Munro was born uh, in Thurso. She was a lady who had a passion for history, a passion for Caithness, um, a, his a passion for history both written and physical. Uh, she, in her later years, uh, owned uh, an antique shop in Thurso, and again, maybe some of you will, will remember that. Um, the collection comprises all sorts of information about local history, about um, the area, about the history of the area. And it includes uh, a huge amount of, of diverse things to do with the history of Caithness. So there are lists of the members of Thurso Cricket Club, for instance, in the 1880s. There are bills and receipts from all sorts of different um, organisations and, and businesses. So there are bills from John and James Shearer, who were silk merchants in the 1800s, bills from uh, Thurso photographers, hotels, threshing mills, all sorts of, of different industries, bootmakers, sail makers, um, distillers, all sorts of things like that. So quite often, if you're if you're interested in a, the history of a local area, this is a, a the type of collection to have a look at because people who before you have been interested in that area will have gathered um, memorabilia to do with that area, the likes of bills and information like that. There are also um, receipts within this collection. So there are receipts for payments to schoolmasters, to peat cutters, all sorts of things that in her travels and uh, in her life she, she gathered up. Information regarding uh, the Caithness Field Club, the history of place, na place names in Caithness, um, posters, magazines, scrapbooks, all sorts of different things. But the thing I really want to talk about in particular is one aspect of this collection, which is uh, her war diaries and war scrapbooks. So before I do that, who is Hetty Munro and why did, why did she have these uh, amazing war diaries? And I hope that you'll agree with me as we go on that how fantastic these diaries are. They are wonderful. 
Okay, so Henrietta Elizabeth Munro was born in Thurso on the 26th of October 1912. And as I say, we'll call her Hetty going forward because that was what she got uh, called. She was the eldest of three children and her father had served in the First World War when she was only a young child. So she had had some kind of awareness of the impact of, of war on a family and on an area. And on her father's return, he continued working uh, in Thurso in Bridgend and he ran Munro's Woodyard. It was quite a sheltered and quiet upbringing in, in uh, Caithness and she said that herself. She later said that they didn't have much contact with the outside world and that in the summer she would go up to her grandfather's croft. But a direct quote from her own words, apparently she didn't like to stay long at the croft because A, the toilet was out in the byre and B, she didn't like hard work. Now, from what I have seen from the rest of this collection and her uh, experiences during the war, I find that very hard to believe. It's important to mention that kind of quiet and remote upbringing because her childhood gave her a love of Caithness and a love of Thurso. The, the type of uh, quiet childhood she had was very much at odds with the life that she led during the Second World War. Um, and also, even just looking at that quote of hers talking back about not liking hard work, you can see her sense of humour and that is something that very much comes across in these diaries. So Hetty was 26 when the Second World War broke out in September 1939 and I wanted to read you the first extract from her war diary. So I want to read it exactly to make sure I get it right. She says, when war broke out, I was in bed. I'd been rather ill and I was at the stage of getting up for a few hours per day. So at 11 o'clock that Sunday morning, I was lying in bed waiting for the fateful announcement, which we all expected and which even though was such a shock when it came. The rain was lashing against the windows and it was just about the most depressing weather that one could wish for. Yet in spite of that, after hearing the Prime Minister announce that Britain was at war with Germany, one had a fleeting feeling of relief almost. That sounds a rather dreadful thing to say about a war, but I think that probably quite a number of people felt the same way. For days after that, the wireless set was never turned off and one listened to all kinds of news and announcements. Not that they meant anything to anyone except the people in the areas concerned but still one listened as if to find comfort from the calm voice of the announcer. Or perhaps because we were living in a very small northern town, rather far from the centre of things at that moment, but a place that we knew would be very much at the heart of things if and when the war really did start. Of course, even before the actual war started, our small town was full of sailors and soldiers passing through to Scapa, and also before the war actually started. Most of the local regiments and batteries were called up along with the reserves. I rather missed seeing things as I was still an invalid, but one day I was out for a short walk and met someone whose husband had just gone to France. That, although I hardly knew her or her husband, I think brought home to me more than anything the fact that we really were at war with Germany. And I think that's a really interesting extract because if you were watching when I talked about the diaries of uh, Malcolm Blaine during the First World War, um, you'll know that that um, personalisation of the experience is very important. That's the thing that makes you really understand a huge global conflict. If you can bring it home to one person you know in the street who's, whose husband has gone to fight, then that, that makes it become very much more real. And I think to some extent that's also true of the situation we're living through at the moment with COVID, that in, in a way it's a far off and distant thing until it comes into your own community or your own family. And, uh, then your your feelings about it perhaps change. So if you remember, um, I think it was in, during Caledonian Canal Week that I spoke a little bit about uh, Scapa Flow, the, the sheltered area where the British fleet was, uh, was based during the Second World War. Well, very early on in the war, uh, Churchill had come up to visit the fleet uh, at Scapa Flow to inspect the fleet, and he passed through Thurso on his way. And Hetty Munro, wrote about this in her diary about her great excitement at seeing Winston Churchill but she describes him rather unflatteringly as a very fat man looking very uncomfortable all tucked up in the back of a car with someone else sitting in beside him. And she goes on to say that he was uh, accompanied by uh, Sir Archibald Sinclair, their local MP, and that Keith Ness were really proud of this visit and that it made them feel as though they were really doing something to contribute to the war, something that had meant uh, Churchill had come up 
to, to visit and go through on his way to Scapa Flow. She goes on to say that they didn't see him come back through the town they were hoping to, but that he went by a huge bomber uh, back to Invergordon instead, and they, they watched outside to see the plane go past. So in September of 39, Hetty went to stay with her aunties, who were at the Standing Stones Hotel in Stromness in Orkney. And she had gone there to recuperate from her illness. And also she, by that point, was, was in the ATS, but I'll come back to that in a second. But it was while she was staying with these aunties that on the 14th of October 1939, that a huge and momentous and difficult thing happened uh, in the Second World War. And that was the sinking of um, HMS Royal Oak. The battleship had been uh, in what was thought to be impenetrable water at Scapa Flow, but it was torpedoed and sunk by a German submarine. There were over 830 lives lost when that ship was sunk. And it was as, as a direct result of that, that the Churchill barriers were built, um, which are huge causeways that block the Eastern approach to Scapa Flow. Uh, I don't know if anyone watching has been there or if anyone's watching from Orkney or, or Caithness, but um, we went there as a school trip. Um, and my wonderful history teacher who I've spoken about during seven, several of these, uh, David Taylor, uh, took us to, to see these and, and told us about the story of this. And you can imagine the impact that something like this would have had, not only on the morale of the country, but a huge impact on that local area to see so many lives lost. And Hetty's diary gives a really personal uh, account of that. And I wanted to read that to you. She said, it just didn't seem possible. Nothing could get into Scapa Flow. And also, we had all been at a dance in Kirkwall the night before with several chaps from the Royal Oak. And it was a very good dance. And five of the boys said that they would just carry on dancing and that they would get a liberty boat back in the morning. And so that their lives were saved. Alan Bell asked if I would like to come to Kirkwall to see what could be seen. And I went. And ever since, I've wished that I hadn't gone. We drove out towards home to find the geo full of wreck wreckage and bodies. The Royal Oak survivors were bundled over to Thurso to get them away from the scene. And houses and rooms all over the town were gladly open to receive them. And again, I think you can imagine if that conversation with one person uh, who, whose husband had gone to serve, to serve had had an impact on it. You can imagine the impact of an experience like that uh, on somebody who has had you know, no experience of things like that. So I think this was probably the next big thing that really brought home to her that the seriousness of, of what was happening. Now, in 1938, so just before this, Hetty had signed up to join the Auxiliary Territorial uh, Service, the ATS. But because she had been ill, instead of staying in the regimental uh, headquarter in the army quarters, she had been allowed to stay with her aunts uh, at the hotel in Stromness. And so because of that, and because when she did go to work um, with the ATS, they were based in, in a, a different hotel, in the Stromness Hotel for their headquarters. And because of these two things, she had loads of contacts and attended loads of events. And so her life was, uh, was full and busy. And she describes the start of her army life by saying this. They had, uh, we had a very considerate boss who explained all the odd things that are done in the army and why they're done. The first few days were rather odd, but we soon settled down. And I find that interesting because I've maybe mentioned before, I have my granddad's Second World War diaries. I have um, information, letters and diaries from both my, of my granddads during the war. And... Um, my granddad on my dad's side, his his diaries say things like that. You know, it's a totally alien environment for people who went to serve and hadn't had any experience of that kind of military systematic way of operating. But the diaries, uh, Hetty's diaries go on to describe different things about different aspects of life uh, on the home front, including what she called the parachute scare. She said, someone got the idea in the war office that the Germans would land men by parachute or by sea in the Orkneys. And all of a sudden, on Saturday night, we were all set to do a terrific lot of operation orders to cover the island in small groups of troops in case the enemy lands by parachute. And she goes on to say that these poor men got split into small groups and were given terrible billets. And she says one man got pneumonia because he'd been billeted to sleep in a hen house. And when the doctor came there to see him, there was a newly laid egg by his head. She has just the most wonderful uh, turn of phrase in these diaries. And she describes the moment 
that a German plane flew really low right over the hotel. And she says everyone was in a flap because they ha- they hadn't expected this to happen. They didn't have the right guns to shoot the plane down. And they were just really unsure how to handle the situation. And she says there was a junior officer there who ran breathlessly into the office to the senior officers and said, what do I do? What do I do? There's a plane flying low outside. And the senior officer apparently said, I'll do the same thing as I'm doing. Come and stand at the window and watch it. So she says, so we all went off. We all trooped to the window and we decided that it really was a German plane and that it really was flying about 500 feet. And then we all went back to work. How to behave in an air raid in one of the most dangerous places in the British Isles. Now everyone is waiting for the enemy to come back today and bomb the places that he photographed yesterday. This is all very interesting. She also describes the time that a plane came down uh, on Hoy and she said they had a much superior map on board. So when the, the wreckage was found, they, they saw that there was a much superior map of Britain on this plane than had been given to the British troops. And so they took it and that was the map they were now using was the German map. And she said all the boys had made themselves lanyards out of the parachute cord to wear. She goes on to say that she hopes that the army will be left in Orkney for a long time or at least for the duration, um, or, or hopefully for the duration, because she says there are a lot of places that would be worse to be in in a war. And then she says, at least I think so. And on that note, I wanted to read you an extract that where she describes the first air raid, land air raid of the war. She says, and this is written on 17th of March, 1940. Well, I certainly do not have the excuse that I have nothing to write about. We have just been involved in the first land air raid of the war. As we were sitting at dinner on Saturday night, we heard the noise of planes overhead. We thought they were enemy planes, and then when we heard guns, we were sure of it. Of course, we never thought of any bombs being dropped, as after all, the Germans had never done anything of that kind. So we went on calmly eating. A few minutes afterwards, we went into the sitting room to have coffee, and I was left there alone for a little time with my companion, Major Mansell. He went upstairs to prepare his room for the guests he was expecting, but just after he had gone, we went to the door to see the shooting. There were lots of rockets going off and the fleet were all in Scapa and we gathered that some of their guns were firing. However, it was very cold, so we went back into the fire. Just after we went back into the sitting room, the most dreadful sound was heard. One would think that huge iron balls were bouncing off the roof. It happened four times in succession and then another four times and then three times. Just after the first bangs, we all rushed into the front hall. No one really knew what had happened, but from the front door, we saw two incendiary bombs fall a few hundred yards away in a field, and then a small fire started in the same place. And then she goes on to say that there, they start to see all these flashing lights. The the skies are lit up in the direction of Stromness. The officers went to Stromness on duty, but some of the naval ones went to put the, the, the small fires out that had come from these bombs. When they came back, they said at least one civilian had been injured and there were people who had come down by parachute. Then she says, by this time, there were all sorts of stories going about. Two people had been killed, Stromness was in flames, Hatstone was bombed, ships were hit, etc. And no one knew what to believe. However, it soon turned out that one man had been killed and a house uh, severely damaged. But it just shows that, that, you know, the huge panic and the huge, um, the, the quickly the rumours spreading and what's happening, what's the confusion and the panic of the situation. And she says, the next day as we were going to work, we saw the bombed cottages. Um, all of them had their windows smashed, but only one of them had been directly hit. And the man who had been killed had been standing at the door of his cottage. And she finishes by saying, of course, it's been the one topic of conversation ever since, and all sorts of stories are going around, although the wireless story was very accurate. And all day yesterday, people were flocking to the site to collect bits of the bombs. I'm going to go on to, to talk about what happened next, um, her, her final uh, times in Orkney and then where she went. But before I do that, uh, I would like to remind you that these, this series is brought to you by High Life Island at no cost to the viewer. That High Life Island is a charity registered in Scotland and that there's no payment or subscription required to take part in these events. So the diaries also uh, include much lighter hearted moments. So, so far what I've been talking about is, you know, direct references to the war and the impact of the conflict. But she talks about her birthday, she talks about um, concerts. There's a fantastic extract where she talks about sledging. 
which says it was a glorious day, beautiful blue skies, um, but a lot of snow. And she says, Andy made us two sledges out of one ladder. And my advice to you is that if someone ever asks you to go sledging on half a ladder, don't. I can't sit down and neither can Mrs. Mac or Prue or Connie. She talks about uh, trips to the shops and she says that at times the war seemed very far away, but never for long. As you'll know through, through this series, if you've been watching them, I have a, a real love for people who can write beautifully and have a, a great turn of phrase. And there is a stunning description where she talks about her love of, of Orkney and describes watching the sunset over Stromness. And she says the sea and the lochs were so blue. The fog was coming down in patches and big stretches of the water became a pinky opalescent colour. On the walk home, I saw flowers bursting out, blackbirds singing, rabbits playing, cattle and horses lifting their heads. All of this we saw and heard. And, su and suddenly the fog lifted and the whole scene was sharply, sharply outlined against the sunset for a moment, a moment of peace and beauty. But we were at war, for suddenly a gun fired, a muffled boom. How tr true Winifred Holtby was when she said that one can always find plenty of men willing to die bravely. The trouble is to find a few able to live sensibly, which I think is a very beautiful quote. She describes the people that she worked alongside. So she talks about uh, her her special favorite, my very special favorite, Colonel Tuck of the Royal Engineers. It says he was responsible almost entirely for the defenses of Orkney, and it was, all had come out of, of his uh, brains, and then he had campaigned to make it happen. She describes a Captain Nussie by saying, uh, "I like him a lot. I don't think he approves of me at all." And she describes the scene at tea break time where she talks about everybody's movements, um, describes uh, people's accents that are grating on her, uh, a man called David singing uproariously at the top of his voice, typewriters going, kettles boiling, and she says, I wouldn't change it for quite a lot sometimes, but perhaps I'm just being sentimental this afternoon. She was also involved in the Orkney Blast, which was a newspaper started for the troops. And on one occasion, she writes that the assistant chief of the general staff had been in touch a couple of days after publication to say uh, that there's something in the newspaper that's gone out about 2,000 copies and it should have been censored and that all copies have to be retrieved and burned immediately. And she says, you can imagine the excitement in the units. Everyone immediately read the paper frightfully carefully and found something censorable in practically every paragraph. Uh, she describes full scale exercises. And if you remember when I spoke about World War II last, I spoke about the Caithness Home Guard. Um, and she talks about this as well, the full scale exercises, and she says this doing the exercises gave one an eerie feeling of war at its grimmest. I also felt that if this was the form that the Blitz was really going to take, one could feel pretty confident that one was on the right lines and on the right side. Uh, in, by spring 1942, Orkney had, had ceased to be the, the centre of uh, the action, and so Hetty wanted to, to be posted elsewhere. And she gives the most phenomenal description of her interview at the War Office. It was a posting that she didn't think she would get. She was, uh, it was a promotion. 3,500 uh, 3, women applied for it. 300 were interviewed and there were 68 positions. She goes on to say that I, she says, I learned about psychology very early. And I learned that if you're going to succeed, you have to stand out for some reason from everybody else. And so she says, um, the Sinclair, the Caithness Company of the Scottish ATS wore Sinclair tartan. They were the only uh, company to do so. They said it was, she said it was the dress uniform, but it wasn't to be worn outside Scotland. But she knew that if she was going to succeed in this interview, she had to stand out from everybody else. So she said she determined to wear her Caithness skirt, her Caithness kilt, um, her Sinclair uh, tartan kilt. And so she said, you know, she knew she wasn't allowed to, so she was trying to, to cover up this fact. And she describes leaving Orkney to go to Inverness, to go to London for the interview. And she says it was very snowy uh, in, in Orkney. So I wore my tartan skirt covered over by my great coat so nobody knew I was wearing it. But by the time she gets to London, she says London is absolutely roasting. The temperature in the war office was high. And even before I got to the fourth floor, I was perspiring freely, but I would not be parted from my coat. And when I was called, 
I took the coat off and left behind me a corridor full of gaping women and I marched into the room. And she says that she's met by a, an interview panel of generals and, and people high up in the army. And of course, she's done something that she shouldn't be doing and that may well be frowned upon by uh, these these military people. But she said instead she, she marched into the room and the man at the head of the table said, oh, here comes Scotland, how's the fishing this year? And we were away, she said. We talked about fishing and shooting and the weather with the, while the formidable AT lady tried in vain to get a word in about my experience with the girls. And I had none of that, of course, so I just avoided that conversation. She said, I had no experience, so I just didn't have that chat. And of course, as you might imagine, she ended up being one of the 68 who got the job. When she uh, came to leave Orkney to go to, to London, she struggled with it. She had become so very attached uh, to the Orkney Islands, but she went and she went to Litchfield for training and she describes it as being hard work and much strict, stricter than, than what she had been used to in Orkney. And she says, I hate it all. I've never liked marching and at the moment I feel like I'll never like walking again either. Every day we do this and every day I hate it more. But it's interesting to note that her superior officers obviously didn't feel that way. They obviously thought that she uh, was very good at it and was a, a, a very strong candidate because she was selected to go to Brockenhurst in the New Forest. And that was where she earned her commission and she came top in her exams and she was posted to the Southern Eastern, uh, Southeastern Command to work alongside General Montgomery. And she says it was an exciting place to be. And of course, the war was all around us. My boss, Brigadier Chitton, uh, was Monty's number two. And we were in on the planning of the Dieppe raid and later D-Day. Every morning, all the staff had to assemble in the hall. And when we were all settled in, in came Monty barking, if you want to cough, cough now. And she talks about the excitement of preparing for the D-Day landings and describes the moment that um, she, she used to go to the theatre in, in London with a, a writer called Pamela Franco. And she describes the moment that they were staying in the officers club and a V1 bomb fell outside. And again, this sense of humour that comes across in this, she says, Pamela was in the bed by the window and I was across the room. And suddenly a bomb dropped nearby, blew her out of her bed onto my bed and blew me off my bed onto the floor. I was most annoyed with this discrimination. But she goes on to say that fortunately nobody had been hurt with that in that uh, bombing. And in May 1944, uh, she left the South and was uh, posted to Edinburgh. And she says the downside of this was that having been involved in all the build up and prep to the D-Day landings, she wasn't there when it actually happened. But on the plus side, the move to Edinburgh brought her a promotion to staff captain. She went back to London for VE Day and she describes singing and dancing and cheering and uh, shouting in the streets and spending the day and the night walking between Buckingham Palace and 10 Downing Street and the War Office and the Mall and just going between all these key sites and being involved in the excitement of the moment. Um, but she does go to say occasionally we went back to somebody's house um, for uh, for basically to have to have food and drink to reinforce them to go out and carry on partying. And Hetty was discharged from the ATS in 1946. She stayed uh, in London, she settled in London working for John Lewis. Um, she had always wanted to visit America and this nearly happened because working for John Lewis they had organised uh, a staff exchange with Macy's in New York and she was uh, accepted to go onto this staff exchange but just as she was about to go her mother fell ill and so she returned to Thurso to nurse her. And although she did go back and visit London, gradually she her heart settled more uh, in the north and back in Caisness. And in 1950, she opened uh, the Ship's Wheel, an antique shop with her brother. And certainly when I was uh, putting something up earlier, someone had said that they remembered her and her brother in the shop. And they sourced much of the furniture for the Castle of May when Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, uh, purchased that. And they gained the royal warrant for their work on that. And every time uh, the Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, visited Caithness in the Castle of May, she would pop in and see Hetty and her brother. Hetty Munro died in 1989, um, but I am absolutely sure she's remembered fondly by many locals. And I have really enjoyed learning uh, about her and reading these diaries and uh, discovering a bit more about her and her personality. I hope you have enjoyed learning about uh, Hetty Munro as well.
thank you for watching. I hope you can join me uh, next week. We'll uh, be looking at the Alexander Fraser Timber Merchants Collection. And then after that, we'll be looking at Christmas in the collections and then uh, festivities and traditions. So I hope that you can join me uh, for the next few episodes to round off the end of this year. Uh, a reminder that this series is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer and that High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to take part in these films. Thanks for joining me.